uh, just to uh, situate this paper, the manuscript you've read, it's kind of a work in progress because I'm working on a book. I was invited by Palgrave to submit a book proposal and trying to explain what is going on in Brazil. So when I first submitted my, paper, my proposal, my book proposal, it was about uh, a different profile of Brazil to discuss uh, this uh, persistent inequalities we have in Brazil because we had a huge problem in consolidating our social security system. And all of a sudden, with the crisis we have in Brazil, uh, the purpose of my book has somehow shifted. So it's a bit difficult, but uh, the title of this coming book is something in between Brazil financialization, mass consumption, and well-being, conflicting paths, or stay with the first one, try to understand what does it represent, this move towards a mass consumption society in a developing country, which is something which is radically different from the path taken by uh, the developed economies after World War II, when they started having this huge mass consumption society. So we haven't solved many structural problems in uh, developing countries like Brazil, we still have a very heterogeneous society. We have problems of uh, heterogeneity in terms of the productive sector, different levels of uh, productivity. So this is a big problem that hasn't been correctly addressed so far. So in this book, I seek to answer to these questions, what kind of complementarity there is between economic and social policy. And this is kind of a regulationist approach. approach and to understand uh, how uh, social policy uh, kind of uh, fueled this new uh, development uh, model. Uh, what are the outcomes of a mass consumer society in a country that hasn't really uh, consolidated permanent mechanisms for redistribution? Uh, as you know, in Brazil, there was no um, reform in the tax system, no tax uh, reform. Uh, since the mid-60s in Brazil, we still have a, a very old, we had some uh, um, parametrical changes in our tax system, but not a real reform. So it's a very regressive one still. So it's very difficult to figure out that Brazil will move towards a, a more uh, homogeneous and more egalitarian country without really going through uh, profound tax uh, reform. And the final question is, um, what is the role of financialization uh, in retooling social policies in Brazil? And uh, I think this is something that will uh, somehow uh, contribute to understand the new role of this conditional cash transfers and other kind of um, social schemes that have widespread in the global south. So uh, in, I'll make a presentation in three steps. So first, the evidence from the 2000s. There was, I think, in my opinion, we had a structural move without a structural shift. So we moved towards this new mass consumption society without really addressing our heterogeneous and very structural problems that remain. Just to give you an idea, since the mid-60s uh, in Brazil, since the mid-70s, because until the mid-70s we had uh, uh, an increase in uh, productivity levels, but after that, in average, the average growth rate of productivity in Brazil is around 1%, and, and it hasn't changed at all. So uh, there is this uh, uh, new development model which has been called social developmentalism. We have a long tradition on developmentalism in Brazil, so I don't have time to explain it here, but uh, you're going to see this later on in my book. And uh, so this new model combines uh, economic recovery with real gains in average earnings, massive job creation. Brazil has created 21 million formal jobs uh, from 2004 to 2014, which is huge, of course. But 84% of them uh, were up to two minimum wage which shows that we have a structural problem because we are just creating low-wage jobs uh, in the formal sector. 
and uh, inequality and poverty also uh, were de declined. And so this has been called a very, uh, more inclusive uh, growth model. And the idea of social developmentalism, the idea of social is that social has been integrated in this new uh, economic uh, growth model. And I have questions about it, because the way we conceive what is an egalitarian society, and, and I think that uh, the um, divergence, that my, my argument is that we uh, had a more inclusive uh, economic growth model in terms of incon incorporating low income groups into the market, but not really making the Brazilian society more egalitarian. So we're talking about uh, social inclusion or market incorporation. Those are two different uh, meanings that have to be uh, understood as such. And uh, what was the main um, uh, uh, fa vect uh, factor, the main uh, uh, yeah, factor that has contributed to uh, develop this new um, uh, market society, mass consumption society in Brazil, it was household consumption. Household consumption, I'll show you some data on this, uh, was the central engine for growth in Brazil uh, since the 2000. And uh, in my opinion, it was made possible by, by a huge increase in credit supply, and not only because we had a better distribution in our earnings. So we, we improved our uh, earning distribution, but in my opinion, this was not sufficient. And this is why I'm working, uh, running some models to try to explain it. So just evidence that Brazil reduced its inequalities is the Gini coefficient. Of course, the Gini coefficient in Brazil is not a uh, very, uh, very good measure because it is um, calculated on the basis of declared income and not disposable income, okay? So it's post-transfer, but not post-taxes. And since we have a very regressive tax system, of course, the reality is not as good as this it shows here. But anyway, it was the first time since the 60s that the Gini index went below uh, 0.5 which is uh, something extraordinary for a country like Brazil. So we moved from the third uh, most unequal country to the 15th. So it's much better, but still, <laughs> we have a long way to go. Uh, so the reality is that we still have a very strong uh, income concentration. So this is just declared income. 85% of this income declared here are earnings from the labor market. Okay, so we're not talking about wealth or other assets that people have, not talking about how rich people are. And you see that uh, the bottom 20% increased uh, by almost 50% uh, their participation in the national income, but uh, it's still 3.6%. And uh, the, the bottom, the top 20% wealthier, they have more than 50% of all earnings in Brazil. And uh, this has been celebrated as a, a new extraordinary path still. This shows you that uh, average income went up in real terms by 43% um, during this period, which is uh, considerable consi uh, uh, given uh, the previous the path of uh, economic inequality we had in Brazil. And this shows that one of the main um, engines for uh, improving earnings in Brazil was the revalorization of the minimum wage. Uh, but it started um, uh, prior to uh, the PT government. It started since Fernando Henrique Cardoso in 19 1994, when we uh, achieved the s stabilization of the economy. And uh, what happened under Lula is that we started having a different uh, measure for revalorization of the minimum wage, which consists of uh, incorporating, adjusting for inflation of the previous year and incorporating, incorporating the real growth of the DGP uh, two years prior. 
And so this gives the minimum wage uh, a real increase. So it followed the increase of the economy, of the, the, the economy activity. And this is why we see that the minimum wage went up much faster than average wages in Brazil, average earnings. And this is also this big table with the components of aggregate demand to show you that actually uh, if you take different periods of growth, um, uh, household, in, uh, household consumption uh, was uh, uh, really the principal component in terms of uh, push, uh, boosting the domestic market. Uh, gross fixed capital formation did not uh, really progress much. Uh, exports decreased during uh, the PT government because, of course, one of the main uh, strategies in order to promote this uh, economic growth model was maintaining this um, um, uh, exchange rate overvalued. And then we could also import a lot and uh, boost this domestic market. So this was a strategy very well uh, organized, even though it had very bad and very negative impacts uh, on, the, on industries, on the Brazilian industry, of course. And you see that, uh, in average, imports in Brazil grew by 9.5% per year. And this explains also why prices went down and how this mass consumption society could emerge. Because we're not only uh, boosting this inward-looking industrialization process, because this did not happen. We have exported a lot of jobs due to this uh, overvalued currency. But at the same time, we could import especially electronics. Electronics in Brazil, home appliances increased by 33.8% per year from 2003 to 2010, which is huge. And this was made possible by this overvalued currency we had in Brazil. OK, and this is also the other issue I'm trying to raise here. So most social developmentalists, they uh, understand that what really pushed this new economic growth model were earnings, because notably due to the minimum wage. The minimum wage explains around 70% of the decline in inequality in Brazil. So we can understand that it had a huge impact. But in my opinion, if we look at total wage here, and uh, this, uh, this figure is a bit old because it doesn't have the, the data for 2013, uh, 2013, uh, you, we see that, uh, you see, in terms of uh, growth rates, we see that uh, credit, total credit, but uh, total credit here, but most consumer credit and personal credit had a very huge uh, surge. Uh, and this was unexpected because uh, since the deregulation of the financial market in Brazil in the early 90s, uh, we did not see such an increase in credit supply in Brazil. So for the first uh, terms of Fernando Henrique, even his second term, uh, credit was not really, really a mechanism in order to boost, to boost economic growth. So it just happened later, and in my opinion, because there were, there were institutional arrangements that were created in order to kind of um, um, uh, establish uh, this new uh, accumulation regime where credit would uh, play a very important role. So we see that the dynamics are pretty different. And just to give you another information, total wages in Brazil uh, increased, but uh, very slightly. Uh, it, they went from 38% of GDP uh, to 43% uh, in 2013. So this means that, of course, we had an increase in terms of, uh, we have a decrease in functional inequality, okay, because we had an increase in total wages, but it's still uh, far below uh, 50%. So if we compare it to uh, developed countries like even Portugal, it's 60%, 62 I think that I was told that now Germany is below 50 as well. 
So I was a bit surprised, but uh, I think that uh, the fiscal adjustment and uh, the economic uh, growth model in Germany made uh, wages go down, and it's true that they just have reintroduced minimum wage in uh, January last year. But anyway, it's still very low huh, as a percentage of GDP. So uh, my, my point is to understand what is the role of credit in this new um, uh, economic uh, growth model and try to understand how it has uh, retooled uh, social policy. Because social policy is firstly uh, defined as a way to prevent risks okay, and to reduce volatility. And this is why uh, social policy had a very important role in paving the way to a sustained economic growth in the post-war period in Europe and in the United States. Everybody who read uh, Krugman knows how, uh, how much he stresses the importance of the social security system in the United States, which is mostly um, uh, uh, job insurance and uh, unemployment insurance, I'm sorry, unemployment insurance and pensions. But this was very important to stabilize demand in the United States as it was also important if we look how fast uh, social spending increased from less than 10% uh, for less than 5% uh, of uh, European GDP to in average 25, 26, 26% now. So uh, the role of social policy has been a knowledge, not only by those who uh, study, who examine the uh, welfare states, but uh, by maker economists who understand that it's very much important to stabilize demand and for this social policy a way to prevent risks and also to guarantee stabilization. And so what, what I think happened in Brazil is that uh, social policy has been ultimately used to underwrite the financial inclusion model, uh, especially because when you live in countries like Brazil, where you have high uh, informal rates uh, in the labor market, now it's around 40% informality, but it used to be 60%. When you have high uh, rates of poverty, uh, so if you have, I don't know, 30%, for, you cannot imagine that these people would be uh, pushed into the consumption market because they, it's difficult for them to have access uh, to credit because, of course, they have no collateral. So if we compare Brazil to a country like India, for, inst for instance, where they don't ha really have a social security system like we do have in Brazil, we have created the social security system back in 88 with the new constitution. Now we have uh, a pension system. We pay 28 million pensions per month, which is huge. And uh, the, the basic pension is equal to a minimum wage which uh, has, of course, a very huge impact in the society because it maintains uh, consumption. Uh, it pushes demand for those who are outside the labor market and who have retired, but also for some poor who can get uh, a public pension of one minimum wage. Um, we have now uh, job uh, uh, unemployment benefits as well. Uh, which are in, ha, they have been introduced in our uh, sec social security system back in 88, and you have also the right for the poor to receive uh, a minimum income, uh, which is pretty low, but anyway, it's a regular income you have. So in Brazil, for instance, um, um, uh, como é que a gente chama? <laughs> uh, o crédito para pobre, hein? Não, o outro. É, no, it's a productive credit for the poor. How do you call it? <coughs> crédito para pobre. <laughs> Microcrédito, microcrédit, sure, sorry. Microcrédito has not really uh, developed in Brazil. Why? Because we have a social security system. So the state can provide 
cash to people in different uh, sorts. In France, of microcredit has not expanded much, but it expanded in developing countries. It has been considered something relatively new, fantastic, because it gave access to people to the financial sector. And as we know, most of this credit was used for subsistence purpose, like in India. And so it's not really to foment new investments, but uh, much more to guarantee people a minimum income for them to survive in a market society. Of course, they need this. But in Brazil, it has never expanded much because, of course, we have a very important social security system. And this access to financialization, this access to the financial markets uh, was made possible exactly through the collateralization of social policies, which is uh, something relatively new because we have linked uh, the right to have access to um, sp special uh, credit loans, credit lines, uh, through the access of either uh, having a, um, a public job, so uh, your salary is guaranteed by the state, or having a public um, pension, which is also guaranteed by the state. And even uh, some uh, welfare benefits could also, because guaranteed by the state, could uh, allow access to the financial sector. So uh, I'll make uh, three points now. Uh, explain why social developmentalists have neglected one major point uh, which is the structure of social spending and its consequences in uh, uh, promoting uh, a more egalitarian society in Brazil, but they benefited from this and they kind of accelerated this uh, dimension, they expanded the dimension of uh, the having uh, cash transfers as uh, the main uh, dimension of our social security system instead of having decommodified uh, services, pr the provision, public provision. And the other thing that have been uh, uh, relatively overlooked by uh, social development is the financialization process and the collateralization process of social policies in Brazil. So I'm going to talk about this, and uh, my final conclusion is that uh, uh, social development, the social developmentalist state was the principal guarantor of pushing finalization further in Brazil, and they did this through the collateralization of social policy. And this is an argument that has been, uh, uh, that created kind of a uh, huge argument among economists in Brazil, who used it to say that uh, it was uh, uh, increase in earnings and uh, increases in the minimum wage that have guaranteed this transition uh, towards a mass consumption society. And actually, we know that 46% uh, of all household consumption in, in Brazil was made possible, 46%. Uh, through the increase of uh, consumer credit for um, households in Brazil. And so it was not only uh, wages that uh, allowed this move uh, to happen. So the financialization trap, why it was important for, uh, sorry, how, how much uh, time is still? Okay, good, thanks. Uh, so there is a, the financialization trap, I think, has not been uh, correctly understood uh, by uh, social development and many other economists in Brazil because, you see, the um, structuralist thought since the late 50s and uh, 60s in Latin America has, also dis has always discussed how it was difficult for developing countries to develop to expand our domestic market. So all this um, um, import substitution model that we had in the past, the idea was that we would be capable of expanding our domestic market, but this expansion was limited by high inequality, by low weights, by this high informality, uh, uh, in short, by this uh, heterogeneity we have 
in uh, Latin, Latin American uh, uh, labor market, but especially in Brazil, which high levels of informality. And what is this, what's the problem with this uh, huge um, heterogeneity? both social and productive, is that we had uh, a very huge supply of labor force that was always around that would accept work for lower wage. So it was very difficult to increase productivity in our countries because we had all these people moving from the rural areas to the urban areas and uh, staying around, not being uh, completely incorporated in the market, surviving. Huh? part of their subsistent, uh, subsistence uh, was um, uh, funded by uh, um, non-market uh, provision, uh, families uh, trying to grow their own uh, uh, food, etc. So it lasted for very long and there was a huge discussion among uh, structuralist uh, economists within CEPAL that it was very important to, to to think about how to increase the scale of domestic market in Latin America because we had this shortfalls in the expansion of demand for consumer goods due to this uh, social and productive heterogeneity. So consumption was boosted, so what should uh, be done? And there was a lot of discussions about uh, uh, increasing productivity, uh, pushing for more investments, uh, trying to innovate. But actually, even the um, uh, classic uh, structuralist economies, they did not pay attention to social policy. Social policy was not integrated into their conceptual framework in the 50s and the 60s. So the idea was we have to uh, increase investment, then investment will push innovation, then pushing innovation, uh, it will help increase productivity, and again, productivity will increase wages, then wages will uh, boost uh, domestic consumption, and all of a sudden, this virtuous cycle uh, of economic development will take place, but uh, their, fo their focus was limited to increasing uh, earnings and uh, uh, wages and not really thinking about the role uh, social policy could have in this process. So they did not pay attention to the role social policy played in Western economies or even in this productivist uh, um, uh, welfare model that we had in Japan and South Korea. Korea, like Brazil, was a very unequal country, a very heterogeneous one. And because they have uh, implemented a welfare state system trying to increase productivity through providing uh, public service and pl public goods like education, health, etc., they could uh, increase average income, they could uh, increase uh, earnings, and they could also increase productivity, and they, in the end, uh, they, they come out with a much more homogeneous society, which is not true in Latin America. Latin America, all countries in Latin America continue to be very heterogeneous society, so not very egalitarian. And so, uh, like uh, Lovolo said, there was this, always this fate that uh, the spillover impact of accelerated economic growth would solve all our problems. So the idea was we should invest. And if you look to, uh, um, there is a beautiful uh, book you probably know by Bertola and Ocampo on the economic development of Latin America. And there is, in their first chapters, they show that uh, we have this uh, structural and um, long-lasting effect for having been um, colonized by Portuguese and Spanish who haven't participated in two uh, industrial revolutions. Huh? So both Portugal and Spain, they have accumulated a big, uh, uh, they were late, they were backward in joining the industrial revolution in Europe. 
And this was also something that had huge impacts in their uh, colonies, notably in uh, Latin America, where the idea that it was important to have uh, investments, to promote investment infrastructure, and uh, for instance, guarantee uh, public schooling for everybody, improving levels of uh, literacy, things that were important in other countries because it was needed by uh, the Industrial Revolution in this kind of, since we have, now, um, uh, rapport salarial, how do you say this in English? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry? Wage or labor nexus, thanks. Uh, so it was important uh, to have a more homogeneous labor force. And so nobody was interested in that because having a cheap labor force in Latin America it was a way of reducing uh, production costs instead of increasing productivity, having a better labor force trained. So this is a, an old debate among Latin Americans. And now social developmentalists have somehow reproduced this. And uh, Ricardo Bielschoff is a very good friend of mine. We work together, we teach together, and we haven't written papers together so far because we have a lot of uh, uh, divergences. <laughs> we don't agree on everything, but we work a lot together. Uh, he thought that uh, if we could, and this so social developmentalist model were somehow formulated by Ricardo, if we could push uh, domestic consumption, at some point uh, it would be necessary to invest. And so capital will, will follow and would, of course, uh, develop some productive linkage and technological information. So the precondition uh, for investment was the idea that we had first to expand uh, domestic markets, the consumption uh, at the domestic level in Brazil, and then investment would follow, which is completely different from uh, the Keynesian approach. And again, social development did not pay any attention to social policy, except uh, increasing the minimum wage, which is a very strong regulatory mechanism, but of course it's not sufficient. And uh, of course, they, they haven't also thought about the role credit should, should play. And uh, they paid no attention at all to the fact that households were having increasing levels of uh, indebtedness, uh, which in periods like now, where we are supposed uh, to uh, uh, relaunch, relaunch economic activity if uh, households have high levels of indebtedness, of course, it's difficult for them to push consumption, okay? So if families are highly indebted, uh, they cannot come back to the consumption market and restart it. Why? Because we, we are in a downward trend. And so it's difficult for them to go again to the financial market and try to get uh, more credit, and this is exactly what the federal government is doing now. Trying to expand uh, credit supply to push families again to be the, um, the, the mechanism that will again renew with economic growth. So uh, I think that financialization also has been overlooked. Uh, because, uh, you see, uh, it, it is like in the social developmentalist model, the state has a very huge autonomy and it can do whatever it wants. And so the idea is that the Brazilian state would be strong enough uh, in order to implement a new development, development model. And uh, I think that all this... Uh, discussion about the reconfiguration of financial markets and mass consumption has been uh, neglected uh, by uh, those in power now in Brazil. And uh, the fact, as I mentioned already, that we have high rates uh, of growing debt levels among families has not been taken into account, and uh, which is, I think, a big problem because uh, uh, this gives uh, room to another phenomenon 
that was uh, not very much uh, known in developing countries, which is securitization. Securitization is when financial markets can sell debts. And there is a secondary financial market now in Brazil, huge, like uh, the recovery, uh, the BTG Pactual is a private bank. They had 40 billion reais, which is around $10 billion in uh, uh, securities. It means uh, loans that have been given to uh, most uh, poor families who receive less than 10 minimum wage, not poor, but average income. Uh, 10 minimum wage now in Brazil today is 7,000 7, reais, which is around, uh, it's less than $2,000 per month. So they're not really rich people. Th those people have a huge debt, and this debt is in those uh, secondary markets, and they're being securitized, and they're being sold, and then it gives the opportunity to financial institutions to renegotiate payments, repayments. And then people, since they, are, they have uh, uh, higher levels of insolvency, they have to renegotiate. They expand uh, the, the period to reimburse the loan, and of course, they have to pay higher interest rates. And uh, just to give you an idea, in average, uh, for consumer credit, uh, the average interest rates in Brazil per year now is 68%, with an inflation by 10. And when people have to renegotiate, it's over 100% uh, interest rate per year. So the, the level of insolvency uh, for these families is really very, very serious. And uh, they are compromising their income, but not only their income, uh, most of the times they are compromising their benefits, benefits that the Brazilian whole society, we don't have, we have um, um, a, um, our pension system is a public one. Uh, it's not uh, f uh, on fund, it's on Sistema de capitalização, what sistema de? Uh, I'm sorry? Yeah, it's a contributory system, but there is a word for this. It's a contributory system. I uh, forgot the, way, the word. Yeah, it's a pay as you go. Thank you. It's a pay. You see, she went to my classes, Anna. It's a pay as you go system. And as a pay-as-you-go system, uh, the generations today are paying uh, the pensions for those who have already retired, okay? So it's based on intergenerational solidarity. So most of what we're doing, our effort in paying for these pensions, 35% uh, of most pensions are becoming financial rents uh, in the financial sector. So it's a transfer from the real economy towards uh, the financial sector, which is very complicated because we are not really pushing for more consumption. We are just trying to make repayments of debts that are increasing every day because, of course, we have these high levels of interest rates in Brazil. And I think that uh, social development have hum somehow uh, uh, failed to acknowledge that we had this uh, consumer-led boom based on credit because people were really focusing on incomes. Uh, they did not pay attention to the proliferation of uh, new types of assets and the penetration of finance in, into more areas of economic and social life, like, for instance, uh, private pensions, who have expanded a lot in Brazil due to incentives that are given by the federal government. You can deduct from your uh, tax income uh, everything you put in your, um, uh, in your private and individual uh, pension fund. So what people cannot do when they are paying for the public fund. <coughs> and also, uh, there is a, a, a new set of uh, uh, private insurances in Brazil. 75% of all Brazilian students uh, at the college level they go to private institutions, most of them very bad uh, quality, and uh, most of them get private insurance. 
And of course, while the rich go to public universities, I'm going to show you the, the uh, figure. Uh, those who are uh, at the bottom of the distribution and want to go to college, they have to take a private insurance uh, or they take a private loan many times and they, with this private loan, they can afford paying for a private uh, institution. So, and when they finish uh, college, sometimes uh, they are jobless because there is no jobs for them, like now, and they have a huge uh, debt to pay for 15 years uh, with interest rates that are growing uh, up. So this is a very complicated situation that um, is happening not by accident, but this has been modeled by this way of pushing towards more consumption and expanding domestic market through uh, credit in Brazil. So uh, one of the main characteristics of uh, times of uh, financialization, as has been highlighted by many scholars already, uh, Paley, Fine, and many others, Sawyer, is that uh, f one of the main characteristics of financialization is that uh, investment rates and uh, profit rates don't move all together anymore, huh? but there is a gap between them. Okay, and during periods of financialization, there is a drop in investment levels. And this is very surprising because even in countries, in developing countries like Brazil, where we're supposed to boost investment, huh, because we need to increase our productivity levels and introduce innovation in this inward looking industrialization process, etc., this is not happening at all. So you see that here shows that there is. I, I believe a true financialization process, I cannot say if it's really a finance-led model, but anyway, <coughs> financialization is changing the way the Brazilian economy works and also uh, how social policy works in Brazil. So uh, the point is that social benefits have been turned into financial rents, uh, not only because uh, we have now uh, compromised part of uh, um, social benefits uh, in order to repay as collateral to repay um, debts, to repay loans, and people take loans uh, just f to buy whatever they want. Uh, so as you, you've seen in the, in the manuscript, in the paper, uh, consumer uh, credit has grown faster than personal credits, oriented credits. So you take consumer credit for whatever you want, and you pay an average 30% interest rate per year, which is uh, considered relatively low compared to other very high interest rates. But uh, these entail a massive income transfer from the real economy to the financial sector. And um, I, th I think that uh, credit link to social policy has been the trigger variable that really contributed to this move towards this mass consumption society. And this is a novel that didn't happen in other countries in Latin America, but uh, it was made possible in Brazil by this new institutional arrangements that take place under Lula. And the social engineering uh, started um, first uh, uh, because we have created some new rules and some uh, new credit lines, but uh, they benefit from another characteristic of the Brazilian social policy. Uh, Brazilian social policy uh, takes most uh, the form of cash. Uh, most of social spending in Brazil is transfers to families, uh, like cash transfers, pensions or welfare transfers, and uh, this uh, represents around 80% uh, uh, of total uh, federal spending, social spending, and 66% of all social spending in Brazil, the three levels of governments we have in Brazil, which is huge. And of course, people lack what they lack, uh, decommodified service, they lack public provisions of service, which are very important. Of course, it costs much more than just giving cash to people. And so, uh, one of the main characteristics of social policy in Brazil is that they have been uh, designed to solve market failures uh, instead of 
uh, underwriting structural transformation instead of providing this uh, public services that would contribute to uh, equalize opportunities among Brazilians. Huh? Because when I give cash, people go to the market and uh, they buy what they want. Uh, but if I give people the same level of schooling, if I give people the same level of healthcare provision, of course they will spend much less and they will have access to the same quality. Huh? And it's not linked, the access to health or to education Will, uh, would not be linked, dependent on their income, but it will be provided as a regular uh, standard, a regular, a regular part for everybody, okay? And uh, so instead of providing, uh, social policy did not provide decommodification, which is the idea that uh, we learned from Polanyi, but uh, quite the contrary. Uh, it provided the possibility of increasing and recommodifying social policy in Brazil. And uh, uh, some social development said that we had this covenant uh, for growth with redistribution. And I think that the covenant for growth uh, was with mass consumption, not really redistribution. Uh, so just to give you an idea how uh, cash transfer are much more important than provision in kind in Brazil, and so we understand uh, that uh, they continue to increase uh, under the Lula's government because it was a way of uh, boosting this uh, uh, domestic consumption. This shows what the consequences are. And you have seen also this in your paper. Uh, uh, it's very interesting to realize that um, access to cell phones and TVs had a huge gap among the bottom deciles and the top deciles of the distribution, but this gap was practically eliminated uh, in uh, less than 10 years, while access to sanitation, to sewage, uh, was not eliminated, remained, because of course this is public provision. So I'm giving people cash and so they can go to the market they can buy with credit and new credit loans, uh, home appliances, but they cannot get. And so when you have the Zika uh, virus now in Brazil, it's not by accident. Because we have, we, there are 35%, uh, 40% of all our uh, households in Brazil that have no adequate sewage. And of course, it rains, it's uh, tropical weather, and then summertime, the virus are back. Dengue is back. And so this is not new. <laughs> and, uh, so we have an epidemia now. And uh, epidemia? Epidemic? Yeah. And uh, you see, people are surprised. Uh, OK? And the private health sector cannot really cope with the situation. OK, guys. This shows how interesting it was, the, the, the decrease in inequality levels for those having um, cell phones. In, the, in 2003, uh, the cell phone distribution was much more unequal and it almost now, how do you say, perpendicular? Yeah, it's almost um, equal. So the way people spend money uh, through all the styles of the distribution is almost the same. Okay, so this is a, a, a Gini distribution and it shows that it has really increased for in terms of access to cell phones. This is also access to public and private schools in Brazil uh, for um, primary and middle school. And what we see is that from 2003 to 2013, uh, there was an increase in access to private schooling. So. Uh, all households in all levels of the distribution are spending more with private schooling. This doesn't happen, for instance, in the UK, which is a liberal country, uh, when uh, people have more uh, income, when their disposable income increases, people are not spending more on primary education because they go to public education. But since public, the, the provision of public education is bad in Brazil, it's insufficient, it's low quality, 
people, as soon as the income go a bit uh, up, they try to look for better opportunities for their kids. So this shows that there is this trend of privatization in terms of so recommodification of social policy in, instead of having the consolidation of decommodification. Uh, this is for the university access. So what is very, very interesting here is that tr uh, due to uh, private loans uh, that have widespread in Brazil and uh, under Lula, and uh, pushing people to go to private universities because the idea that, you see, everybody has to have a college degree, otherwise it's very difficult to, to get a good job in the labor market. And we have uh, uh, returns in schooling that are dropping in Brazil at the same time. But this is another question. I'm not going to address this here. But what we see is that uh, the only the top uh, this aisle of the distribution increased its participation in public uh, universities, which are the best universities in Brazil, in average. Okay, so most uh, people in all the this aisles of the distribution, students are going to private universities, and they're paying for this, uh, taking uh, loans at uh, public and uh, private banks. So this is, of course an expression of new forms of inequality. It doesn't, uh, it's not sufficient to say more people are going to the university, but they're going how? When they leave university, they will have a debt. And if they don't get a good job, uh, so who's going to pay for the debt? And then what happens? Families with um, pensioners or public servant, servants, they go to the, to the bank, they take a consigned credit, and they pay for the loan. So the whole family is involved in repayments and repaying loans that have been taken for different members of the household. So it's a process, a, a very large process of indebtedness that is taking place in a country where it's written in the Constitution that uh, education should be public, universal, and unconditional, like healthcare. And so this is just to show uh, the difference between average earnings that increased by 1.4 during this period under this uh, social developmentalist model and how uh, the cost of education has increased much faster. So of course, even though we have higher earnings, uh, the cost of private education uh, is going up much faster. So I cannot afford paying for this. And it's obvious that I'm going to go to a bank to get a credit loan. Uh, this is just to give you also some uh, information. It's not on the paper on the healthcare system in Brazil. We have introduced uh, a healthcare system that has been inspired uh, by the English, the British National Health Service. OK, so public, uh, like in France. France is a bit different, but it's, uh, we have the same uh, uh, framework uh, as the British. So we were supposed to have a public provision of health care and Brazil is spending more, uh, the private spending in health is higher in Brazil than uh, public spending, which is a, a huge contradiction <laughs> in all terms. And so we're spending 5% uh, of, uh, of um, on 9% of um, uh, expand expenditures with health uh, as percent of GDP, 5% of private, and 4% of our public. Most of the spending is out of pocket, which is high risk. Because if, you have, if you're paying for um, uh, private health uh, plans, OK, you're paying. So this brings you some security in advance. You don't know if you're going to have uh, I don't know, uh, an illness or not, or an accident, doesn't matter, but you're paying for this. But when most of this expenditure is out of pocket, it means that you don't know what's going to happen, and maybe you don't have savings enough uh, to cope with this, and then you're going to go again to the bank to get credit loans. So this is really something that shows how complicated is uh, the, the provision of uh, public health in Brazil. And again, we see that the costs of uh, um, health care services uh, go up much faster than average income. 
And this explains that the distribution of uh, income uh, uh, related to uh, healthcare services in Brazil continues to be extremely unequal, okay? Which is not the case with uh, the cell phones I showed you before, uh, because of course home appliances have a different approach. So what were the mechanisms that have been created by the government, by the PT government? The consigned credit in 2003 for civil servants, former workers and pensioners. So repayments are withdrawn directly uh, from the debtor's wage or benefit by creditors. Uh, people could uh, compromise up to 30% of wage, now it's 35% of wages. And in the state of Sao Paulo, the level of indebtedness of, for uh, civil servants is so high that uh, for uh, state civil servants in the state of Sao Paulo, the government allowed uh, the, um, uh, debt to the, comp the compromise of uh, earnings to reach 50%. So people are taking 50%, uh, the, the bank is taking 50% of wages that are not paid that go direct to the bank and people then they get only uh, half of their uh, uh, payment. So after that there was this new regulation microcredit but it did not really change much uh, because again Brazil uh, microcredit is not very um, widespread spread in Brazil. And then also we create a specific program for uh, those who are recipients of the Bolsa Familia program. And uh, it's spreading much more now. So uh, they pay interest rates which are much higher than consigned credit because since they're poor, uh, they cannot uh, benefit from uh, consigned credit. Consigned credit are, is uh, only for those who have a regular income that is guaranteed by the government. So if they are not poor anymore, they're going to lose their benefits, their welfare benefit, and so this is why they cannot enjoy better interest rates. So uh, there's a process of securitization on the way, uh, build on individual loans secured by income. So this is the logic of the process. There is this debt economy that uh, is spreading very fast. And of course, instead of having the welfare state since we had in the 50s, 60s, 70s in Europe, and still have in many countries like France, or the enabling state, an idea that it was important that the state, instead of providing services and goods, the, sir, the state should push people, uh, should pe make people more responsible. So this was the idea of the enabling state in the United States, so the idea of workfare instead of welfare. Now we have the debtfare state, the state pushing for debt, and this is an idea that has been developed by Soderbergh, with, which is a um, um, German a political scientist that lives now uh, in Canada. So uh, social policies, huh? become and social, social protection benefits become a function of business. And this is brand new. This is something that didn't exist before because social benefits were also a, uh, were exactly a means in order to provide security and to cope with uncertainty, with volatility. So they were always seen as countercyclical. And now they are being used in terms of procyclicality, which is a big problem. And at the same time, uh, the Brazilian uh, social security system is being dismantled. Just to give you an idea about how credit uh, had this huge surge uh, under the PT government, uh, it's more uh, the credit line that uh, uh, expanded faster was non-oriented, so you can take it for whatever you want. So it's uh, uh, consumer credit. You see the interest rates, which are very, very high. You see uh, uh, inflation rates are the red bullets below. And you see that in average, those are average by the central bank, very huge. And uh, the consigned credit is much lower here. But only uh, two categories of workers and pensioners can have access to this. And so the others have to pay for uh, very high interest rates. And this is very interesting because this shows the level uh, of how uh, in Brazil 
uh, if we compare Brazil to other countries like France, Germany, the UK, and the US, you see that the share of disposable income in Brazil is compared to what it is in the United States, which is a liberal country, okay, where credit uh, plays a role in order to replace social policy. This is not the case in Brazil. We have a social security system. This should not be like this. But uh, as Trumbo has shown, uh, American unions uh, accepted uh, at some point to negotiate credit during uh, strikes, etc., access to credit to increase uh, workers' earnings. Uh, this is not the case in France, in Germany, where access to credit has never been used as a way to cope with tough times or uh, uh, periods of uh, downward economic trends. And uh, this just to show you that, in average, for consumer credit, Brazilians, it's all Brazilians, they compromise 28% of their average income which is exactly the same as in the United States, around 30. And if we uh, add uh, mortgage loans, it's around 46%. But if you take people with zero to three minimum wages, but only borrowers, this is the uh, average Brazilians, okay? So I'm inside, I have no debts. But here, only those who are borrowers, in average, 64% of all Brazilian income is compromised with repayments in financial loans, credit, and uh, for the zero three minimum weights, up to three minimum weights, it's 73%. So this is a very serious situation, and this was made possible by the collateralization of social policies. So um, I think that uh, we have uh, missed a step in Brazil because people paid no attention to uh, the social security system we have. It's being dismantled uh, because most of our um, funding has been diverted from the social security to other issues. Anna Carolina made a great um, master uh, thesis on this issue, and she has shown us with very good data, very um, updated data, what happened with this uh, money that has been taken. Uh, from the social security system to subsidize capital or to form our primary surplus, which is a problem because we're taking money from our contributions uh, to subsidize uh, uh, mostly the financial sector. And so this process of financialization is spreading and subsuming social policy. So my point to wrap up is just to say that I think that it's true that Brazil has promoted a structural move under the PT. It hasn't changed the Brazilian society. The Brazilian society remains as heterogeneous as it was in the past. We still have low levels of productivity. We have not boost innovation. Uh, most of uh, this process in terms of expanding the domestic market was based on imports. And of course, we have exported, exported uh, jobs uh, to Asian countries, uh, mostly. So we are in a very difficult situation. And uh, the, the problem is that now people just want to expand again this process because we are facing uh, this uh, economic downward trend. We're in a huge crisis. We had a negative economic growth last year. We're going to have, an, again, an economic uh, negative economic growth this year and probably the coming one. And so the, 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 the way out seems to be, again, give more cash, give more credit to people so that, so that they will uh, consume, they will go to the domestic market, they will expand the market, and again, the faith and the spillovers impact of this uh, let's say, model would at some point uh, work. And I think that uh, it's a chimera and uh, uh, it's complicated. I think that Brazil will stay for long in, um, in this situation where it's very sad because uh, first people had no much earnings, they had lower uh, wages, and they were in tough situation. Now they're they in the similar situation, but they are highly indebted. 
And of course, we are again transferring real income to the financial sector, and it's the financial sector who are uh, dictating the rules now in Brazil. Thank you. So first of all, thank uh, Professor Lavinas for being here today and for bringing uh, this issue that it's so relevant as dramatic. <laughs> so this is the structure that our, we are going to follow in our presentation. We are going to briefly introduce the social developmentalist uh, uh, model. Then uh, we are going to the conditional cash transfer that has been one of the the main points in the, of the cash transfers in the in the Brazilian state, and then to the to a <coughs> to the further compression of the this new welfare system, and then Gabriel, where it's going to focus more on the financialization issues regarding to development and uh, the inclusive financial policies, and also the implications of the expansion of credit in the last years in Brazil. And we will add with some questions. So this is uh, roughly the, the model that uh, underlies the social developmentalist uh, uh, growth theory. It's focused mainly in uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, virtue cycle. Uh, by boosting demand, they expect it to uh, increase the investment and through the through innovation, as uh, Professor Lavina has commented before, uh, rise productivity and so real wages. So this can uh, again uh, boost uh, demand. So mainly the idea was to to start this uh, boost of the demand by uh, increases in, in in real in in the income of population and also with uh, social spending. So uh, there's two questions that are uh, are not reflected in in this conception. First, uh, a social developmentalists have neglected the, the important role of that credit has played in the boosting of the demand in Brazil. As Professor Lavinas has commented, uh, it uh, can be accounted more than 40 percent of this increase in the in the demand. And second and more important, it's a flow in, the, in this growth model. Uh, it's that put the social policies uh, just as an income to boost demand instead of being a, a structural, an structural uh, way to transform society and uh, be able to sustain this productivity and real wages increases. So, uh, if we take in account the, the success of, of the Fordist regime in the post-war period, uh, we can see that uh, it was really important for, for the growth, uh, the progressive tax system, and also the, the public investment in providing universal access to infrastructures, uh, like uh, in really important education, also transport, and uh, in, contra in contrast with, uh, in opposition with, uh, with this, this model, uh, as, we, as I have said before, uh, social developmentalist uh, put social policy just in a, in a corner. So uh, social expenses, expenditures uh, during these years were mostly based in, in cash transfers instead of providing uh, public uh, uh, public uh, goods and services in, in kind. So cash transfers accounted uh, around three quarters of the total social spending. And we can see here in this table uh, how health and education spendies, expenditures uh, in kind have evolved really poorly. So for example, uh, uh, this uh, numbers are in percentage as, as percentage of uh, GDP. So for example, his, uh, health, the expenditures of, of federal government in health has even 
decrease as a percentage uh, of GDP, and education has uh, just increased uh, really slightly. And uh, on the other side, the welfare benefits, uh, uh, non-contributory transfers of the government has even more than doubled during this time, reflecting this, this focus in, uh, in this kind of social model. So we are going now to focus a little more in, the, in one of the main points of this cash transfer, the conditional cash transfers that uh, has been argued like in the last years uh, being the, the state of the art to combat uh, poverty. So this, this uh, social policy is based on in targeting uh, sectors uh, of the society, the, the, the poorest one, and re really a low income. And uh, the second point is that, that are based in uh, uh, these runs, these benefits are based in, uh, in accomplishment or third time conditions. They can be uh, the attendance of the, the kids to, to a school or visits to health clinics. So these conditionalities uh, are argued to to be a way of, uh, of addressing successfully the, the, the problems of poverty in the long term and also makes uh, feasible uh, the implementation of these policies both for policymakers and for taxpayers to accept if you, uh, if you are giving money and if you are conditioning this money to the attendance of school, for example, it's make easier to uh, to justify it uh, to to the taxpayers. Another important point in the uh, in the growing of these programs in the last year has been the the change in uh, in the World Bank that uh, it's now promoting since uh, uh, the beginning of the of the century is promoting these, these, uh, these programs of cash transfers. Uh, so the first, uh, the first program was implemented in Chile in 1980, then also in, in Argentina, but were these programs were at the beginning really, really small, so the, the first large uh, scale programs were applied first in, in Mexico with the Progresa program now opportunities and uh, then in Brazil with the Bolsa Familia program that it's the, the biggest na the biggest one in, in the world uh, it achieves 26% uh, of Brazilian population how much 26 it's correct yeah, yeah. okay <laughs> so uh, we have to take account uh, <laughs> collateral issues of the, these cash transfer programs because they have been arguing to be a, a really successful program to combat poverty. So the, the, the first important point is that we have to interpret properly the data. Uh, first, uh, poverty measures, the, the threshold that are applied has, uh, must be taken into account because, for example, in Brazil, uh, thresholds for poverty and indigence are really, really, really low as compared, for example, the, the ones here in Europe. And also, uh, how much we input uh, the reduction of poverty to those programs instead of other sources of poverty reduction, it's really important. And in the case of Brazil, uh, it has shown that uh, the the increase in the job, crea the job creation and also the increase in the, in the minimum wages has played a more important, the, the most important role in reducing poverty. And also the, the contributory transfers such as pensions that uh, are an important uh, source to reduce inequality, while uh, those uh <coughs> cash transfers play a marginal role in this reduction of inequalities. 
so uh, also conditionality um, uh, brings some problems since uh, it's expected that the most vulnerable groups, the poorest one, are the ones that are going to face the, the biggest difficulties to to meet the, the requirements of such conditionalities, and they can lose the the benefit due to that. Also, targeting it's uh, quite problematic. It it's only focused in the in the most poorest uh, sector of the society. And also the, the discretion that it implies uh, has been uh, causing uh, important problems. And uh, also one of the, of the points that had been stressed by some people is the, the social cost of these programs. Uh, since it has been a source of, of social division between, uh, between the, the people that uh, receive the benefits and the one that uh, has not been uh, eligible. Also the, the taxation system is it's important since uh, these cash transfers materialize in the form of consumption so they are going to be taxated so if we have a quite regressive system at the Brazilian one uh, the role of this cash transfer uh, is quite impaired. And also it can play, I want to display this in the next one. Uh, another important point is that they can uh, drain sources uh, from the, the provision of, of goods and services in kind by, by the state, they commodify, they, they commodify it once. So this is a trend that he ha we have uh, witnessed in the last years. Uh, we have uh, uh, a dismantle of the of the welfare system, giving uh, open the the way to to private markets, to provision of service in uh, education and health, and also in, ins in insurance with the privatization of, of the funds, fund uh, pension systems. And uh, okay. Mm -hmm. So we have seen this retrocess of the of the state in the in the in its implication in the welfare system, and uh, now we have seen the absence of capital markets as the new providers of of uh, of the welfare, like I have uh, said before, with pensions, and also with the. Uh, with uh, new claimant rights at uh, financial inclusion and credit as welfare that uh, Gabriel is going to comment more deeply. Uh, so when we take uh, financialization uh, inside this context of uh, provision of social goods, we have uh, the idea of the mercantile the mercantilization of the social goods that uh, as also mentioned in Professor Lavinia's uh, presentation uh, remounts to Polony's uh, ideas in the Great Transformation that was due to the period of liberalization uh, in Europe and the implication that this liberalization uh, was bringing to the social relations and how the state should uh, intervene and then provide the basic rights uh, to the living of uh, its population. And these rights shouldn't go to the market, shouldn't be uh, provided um, based on the market relations and Trumbo brings us uh, the case of uh, Europe and the US in the 70s uh, when also uh, professor, uh, professor mentioned that uh, in the 70s was a period of stagnation uh, of the income uh, among the population and this was uh, also uh, during a time there was a boom of the, cr the um, 
provision to credit uh, in a place to uh, substitute this access to goods that their wages couldn't uh, buy and then uh, the state was acting as facilitating policies for the population to borrow money and as we can see um, in his code so uh, uh, as long as these poor consumers they will continue to borrow uh, the interest payments uh, work it to defeat the effects of social transfers intended to improve their material condition of the poor. And when we can see this in the Brazilian scenario, uh, was this really applied and this uh, mercantilization of the social goods was applied to Brazil and uh, are these uh, policies that implies cash transfers, they are really able to provide the equity and the so social justice that they intended they intend to. So uh, when we see the, the um, timeline of the, fi the inclusive financial policies in Brazil, it started with the consignate credit. I, I would just like, give a general idea so we can understand. Uh, professor also mentioned uh, consignate yeah. credit that uh, was given, um, you can borrow money and it's only to a class of workers and instead of they go and pay, this uh, payment is already debt in their account, so uh, it's a more uh, guarantee to the borrower. And then we also had the higher minimum income gains and the Bolsa Familia, so we could see there was an increase of the population income gains and then that gave access to them to buy goods that they couldn't before and as we can see the the inequality among the population was diminished uh, not so much but and not it into a good point but it was diminished but when we see if this was uh, if it was given them a uh, public provision of goods uh, we cannot see that much but their uh, income gains was indeed uh, a fact and the re uh, real inclusive financial policies they started between Lula and Dilma mandate the um, real push into this inclusive financial policies and as we can see this expansion was uh, related to the access of to certain social policies as Lavina says and the entrance of this before excluded um, level of society into this consumer market but as we could see this it was a push to the consumption but it wasn't a push to uh, the structural change and the productivity couldn't follow this uh, big amount of consumption that was um, entering uh, into Brazil economy so it was a duality between this existential public spending and public services spending. As we can see in, in her article, in her paper, we see that the existential public spending growth to a rate of 300% when the public services regarding education and health uh, only grew 100% and 60%. And the inclusive financial uh, forum in Bahia that was uh, made to gather actors to give the guidance to these um, inclusive finance policies that were happening in Brazil, uh, we can take this as the main idea that they were saying that these inclusive policies were given to give this access uh, to microcredit, to small entrepreneurs, individual entrepreneurs, but also making the link of the access to goods and uh, social policies and people having this, the access to this, um, to this um, level of income that they were having uh, through credit. So we could see that the main, one of the main ideas was trying to push um, to push the social policies uh, linked to uh, access to credit, the main idea of the government. So is this uh, a really welfare state provided by the Brazilian government? Because we can see that there is a bias uh, in this inclusive finance because it incentives uh, to consumption via credit, but we don't see the real provision of goods by the, uh, by the state to the population that, as we saw before in the the idea of the, the mercantilization of the social uh, goods uh, shouldn't go through the market, they should go 
uh, by by the state helping them. So and also to uh, to give this. Um, this welfare uh, policies depending on market oscillations because as we can see uh, there is a lot of people in debt uh, depending on taxes and these taxes in Brazil uh, also they oscillating and really high so we are leaving this population um, depending on these market oscillations is this uh, the real welfare that we want and this situation that a, a favorable conjecture uh, with accelerated growth, that um, a strong and effective pol uh, political figure that uh, could make us go uh, out of the first financial crisis in 2008. Uh, and these gains, they were able to channel uh, into cash transfers and financial inclusion of the population that was be uh, before ignored in the market. But as we could see, there were implications of this process and we couldn't really uh, fight against poverty. We don't see this uh, happening now, especially into a crisis situation. So it's the paradox that Lena showed in the paper, like people have access to goods such as TV and cell phones. I think there is one cell phone by person in Brazil today, but they don't have access to sanitation or uh, a public and good education. So. It's a paradox what the government is really providing uh, Brazilian population. So w what we can see in this figure is, was the expansion of credit and this uh, population inside a uh, huge debt. But when we compare Brazil to others, it's in Portuguese, I'm sorry, but uh, it's based on IMF uh, in 2013, uh, in 2014, but to some countries is 2013. When we see the figure of Brazil, the total um, condemned uh, parcel of the the debt is not too much as we can see uh, in the others the indebtedness co corresponds the total indebt in the country corresponds only to 21 percent of the GDP that is not too as much as other developed countries but when we see these interest rates payments they re reach 22,000 of the household's monthly income then I also stress that what uh, goes uh, from this income of the population to pay uh, this debt is really high. So uh, it's a quite, and also there is a qualitative difference in this indebtedness of the the households because they are more to pay this rate and also to they are mid-term uh, maturation. So this uh, the income are, are really into a bad uh, shape when it comes to repay this credit that they are taking. And the real winners, the by the end of 2014, 28.8% uh, of Brazilian household income was direct to consumer debt payments to the financial sector. So who are the real winners of this figure of inclusive financial that was supposed to give um, a welfare state to the population? And as we can see to wrap up, it was a structural move. It was a huge uh, push to mass consumption, but it there wasn't a structural shift that Lena showed us. So uh, sustaining this consumption uh, through this increase in high cost borrowing and this collateralization of social uh, benefits in times uh, of cuts in welfare provision and, and the private privatization of healthcare and education was a mark of this uh, social developmentalism model and we can see in also in a crisis situation if the population is really the winners of this model and especially when we can see that they are so um, so emerged in huge debt and with a financial and economic situation in Brazil that was before uh, trying to recover based on this uh, mass consumption cycle cycle is condemned. It cannot follow this model anymore. So uh, the question is also, as Lena stressed, how can we do this uh, recovery if our um, main instrument is also stressed out. We didn't give them any public goods uh, in terms of services and they are highly in debt 
with sometimes uh, the financial institutions. So who is uh, who this developmentalist model was for? So we come to some questions to to Lena. Okay, the first one is regarding uh, how can uh, a proper welfare state be implemented in Latin American countries since it, requir it requires a big effort in uh, funding and both in deep transformation of the society. So can, how could, be, how could uh, this be addressed in the Latin American context? Uh, okay. Uh, also regarding the financial inclusion, this uh, has been a, a trend in <coughs> uh, as a, the introduction of uh, as a, a new right in the, this new welfare. Uh, so, until which point uh, this uh, this model that is, is been now introducing in developing countries such as India uh, can be a, a success in providing a, a better life standards in those countries? Uh, and the, as you always um, also show to us uh, from Lazaretto, this debt economy that goes to the drive to make social protections a function of business, where the right to a social be benefit is captured and transformed into debt, becoming the creditor's pro property. And recent news uh, are showing that in a crisis scenario that we are living right now, the FGTS will be possibly used as a guarantee for consignment loans. So how much this can compromise the workers that beyond being unemployed, they will also have their right taken away uh, because of their debts. Sorry, it, it was missing there. And also the state banks, they play, uh, uh, this second question. The state banks, they play an important role secured by the states in this process of financial inclusion and provision of credit. As uh, we already mentioned, do you consider them as the really good guys that are giving people's credit and are giving access to this low income population to goods that they couldn't consume before? Or And who are the real winners in this welfare uh, process in Brazil? And also the the last question that I th think this all this uh, figure culminates to this crisis that we are uh, having now. So how much of that came from the developmentalist model and the combination of such policies they helped to deepen the actual crisis in Brazil. And as I already said, the cycles of comp uh, consumption are not working anymore with recovery. So. The big question in Brazil: Where lies the new economic model to that can um, push us into the track again, and also that can be able to provide um, public goods to the population in such an austerity moment that we are living now? And there is was one question missing here that uh, Tombini, um, our central bank president, he said in one of the, his last decla declarations that. Um, trying to justify the the Selic uh, rate, that the interest rates that are used in Brazil are applied to us, and they shouldn't be, we shouldn't base in other countries to formulate it, and it's totally different um, world. And how do you think how sustainable are these rates, especially uh, when they are used as one of our main instruments to hold back inflation? Uh, in a concept, in a context that we saw pushing to uh, mass consumption, so I think that's it. Okay, if you want, we can leave the questions f so you can look. Okay. <laughs> we sit, <laughs> we sit, or no? Yeah. Some questions. Okay. So I think that uh, 
Gabriele. E é actor, they did a great job, so thank you so much for reading the paper, making comments, paying attention, and raising other issues like uh, uh, this um, conditional cash transfer, how, how they have widespread in Latin America, and what are the consequences, and uh, I think that you, you have looked for other issues that I haven't addressed during my presentation, so it has uh, improved the debate here, so many thanks. So let me first just came back to how long do I have? Five minutes? Yeah, so what time is it? <coughs> it's, in total, we have one more. Okay, so I'll try to speak for 10 minutes because you see, otherwise, we tend to repeat ourselves. Um, so, what is important to understand when. Uh, <coughs> Polanyi talks about uh, decommodification is this double movement that he has uh, highlighted under capitalism, because capitalism makes everything commodities. Even labor force, huh? we're not a commodity, but we think that selling our labor force in the labor market, the labor force becomes a commodity. So, and what uh, Polanyi has shown is that there is this double movement. At the same time that everything becomes commodities, it's necessary to decommodify uh, a certain uh, number of uh, services, goods, and the way we reproduce life. Because otherwise, uh, it's, uh, we will go first, it's not going to be sustainable in the long term, we're going to have a lot of distortions, etc. So this double movement, commodification and de decommodification at the same time, was characteristic of the Fordist um, um, economic development model, uh, the Fordist regime. What changed, and there is a wonderful paper you should read by Nancy uh, Fober, uh, no, Nancy, Nancy, not Nancy, eh? Forbes Lesson. Yes, no, Nancy Forbes Amherst, but the other one is Nancy, it's not Nancy Forber. Anyway, uh, she's a sociologist, she has written a, not a new paper on how uh, uh, finance is commodifying everything. And she talks about this process of commodification all the way down. And I think that what is new under this uh, uh, finance-led uh, regime or movement or this process of financialization that we are recommodifying everything. And this is why you have this uh, pension seats that are privatized and, and people think that it's much better. Perhaps they forgot that uh, after the 2008 uh, financial crisis, in average, in the United States, um, pensions uh, dropped by 40%. Uh, and some people had to uh, um, uh, hold their, they, they decided to um, uh, take their pension to retire, and they have to postpone it because the level of their pensions went down so much that they could not live on this. So the idea that w what is private is better, that private uh, is more, uh, privatization is more efficient, that it, they will deliver, uh, pr by privatizing, will deliver better subsidies, etc. This is a very strong uh, achievement of neoliberalism. Uh, because neoliberalism, globalization, uh, financialization, all those three trends like Epstein and Show are integrated. So it's very important to understand what is going on. We are financializing everything because we have monetarized everything before. So what does this uh, uh, conditional cash transfer mean in Latin America? Of course it's much better because now we have uh, at least some welfare benefits that are provided to the very poor. So I went to Guatemala to assess the national conditional cash transfer program which was called uh, Mi Familia Progresso, like something like this. And of course, you see all those Indians that now have a minimum income, uh, Indian, indigenous communities. It, it's also true in Bolivia, it's true in Ecuador, everywhere. So what did we do? We have monetized, uh, we, we provided monetary income to families. So this is the best way to uh, 
guarantee that capitalism is expanding their markets, the, so the market society, because we are breaking with their traditional way of living based on subsistence, etc., cetera, et cetera, based on guaranteeing, for instance, that nature does not become a commodity. Uh, what is going on in uh, Bol uh, Bolivia? What is going on in Ecuador now? Uh, they are fighting to guarantee that water uh, sources will remain public because everything is being privatized by the Chinese. Okay, so we have to understand what is really going on because this push towards more and more commodification is uh, uh, international. It's a global trend and it's not only limited. But we started this by giving cash to people. So for instance, in Brazil now we have many indigenous communities whose land has been invaded by uh, the agro-business. And they're given uh, in replacement cash transfers. And though they live in cities and they buy their rice, their food, and this is not their traditional way of living. And the Brazilian constitution guaranteed that they should keep their traditional uh, way of living, and that they, they there are res uh, not reserves. How do you say this in English? Reserves for the indigenous. Yeah. Yes, reserves. I think there is another word, but anyway, huh? Reservation. Reservations. Uh, there are reservations for the indigenous community. We should preserve their lands. Their land is not cannot be privatized, but it is being privatized. So this is the point. Everything <coughs> is becoming a commodity. And I think this is the big push of this uh, uh, financialization process. Huh? And this is why even social policy, whose uh, main uh, purpose was to reduce vulnerability, since social policy is helping uh, uh, provide access to the financial markets, since social policy is being collateralized, we are increasing vulnerability again, instead of reducing households' vulnerability, instead of reducing risks. Now they have different risks. But when I was attending uh, an IMF meeting, uh, I think it was in Geneva uh, some years ago, the guy from the IMF said, no, because you see, uh, in the mid-90s when I went, uh, I was invited to the World Bank to talk about Bolsa Escola in Brazil, Bolsa Escola came uh, uh, prior to the Bolsa Familia. And Bolsa Escola was um, a welfare program implemented by Brazilian municipalities in the first uh, period of uh, redemocratization in Brazil, in the mid 90s. Okay? And uh, the um, uh, municipalities that were run by the Workers' Party were uh, those uh, in the avant garde in implementing this kind of program. But at that time, uh, the World Bank was against minimum income. They said, no, we should not give uh, uh, a minimum income to the poor because, okay, the poor, they don't know how to spend this money, you see? So the poor, they have an inefficient uh, consumption. When we give them money, we should give them uh, uh, in-kind policies, like, for instance, uh, we have in the United States this, um, food stamps program, yeah, because then people can only buy. Now, of course, they buy, but in Brazil also you used to have. And all of a sudden, they understood that uh, this idea that uh, the poor have an inefficient consumption, that they will spend wrongly this money, they understood that they were limiting uh, the expansion of uh, markets worldwide. And this is why being against uh, minimum income programs in the mid 90s, they turned towards, uh, they became favorable uh, to those programs. And why? Because they have implemented this, what they call the uh, social risk management strategy. And the idea is that we should uh, focus on the poor, we should target <laughs> poverty and not social security programs. We should not uh, take into consideration that, of course, uh, people should have pens, etc. Let's take care of the poor and let's leave the rest for the market. So the idea of those anti-poverty programs is that the state, and there is a new policy that has just been implemented now uh, by the IMF, World Bank, and also the UN, because now they're all 
they gather all together <laughs> and they have a single strategy, which is very complicated to um, contest. Is the idea of um, piso de proteção social? It's a minimum floor. Uh, it's a um, social protection floor. It's called in English. What is social protection floor? Okay, we're going to provide a minimum income for those who have income deficits. All we're going to provide also, let's say, basic schooling, just primary schooling, and we're going to provide also basic care health, so let's say immunization, things like that. For all the rest, we have the market. And if you read Schiller, who has been a uh, uh, Nobel Prize in economics two years ago, Robert Schiller, she says, okay, let's transform uh, Walmart consumers into Wall Street uh, investors. This is the idea that we should democratize finance and to democratize finance, we had to transform needs, people needs, also in things that finance can fund or can allow having access to. So it's a, a whole new process that is taking place now. And of course, if I go to the bank, I need a collateral. Okay, I cannot go to the bank if I don't have a regular job, if I don't uh, ha have regular earnings, if I don't have assets, if I don't have a house. And this is why the idea that we should link social policies with uh, credit lines is necessary. Because otherwise, and this is why the World Bank also agreed uh, on pushing for those minimum income programs. Even in very uh, poor countries, it's very cheap. Uh, uh, Bolsa Família is 0.5% of Brazilian GDP. All welfare programs amount to 1.5, but only both of them is 0.5. It's the, it's one percent in Ecuador. It's the higher uh, percentage, the higher rate in Latin America. So it's very cheap. It's nothing. You don't need to make uh, uh, profound tax reforms. We don't need to charge the rich to tax the rich. You don't need anything. Okay, just make uh, things work, and we give some and. Uh, some cash to the poor, and since they have a very high propensity of consumption, okay, everything comes back. And in Brazil, it's worse because since we have not only a regressive tax system, but most taxes in Brazil uh, are indirect, and so they charge consumption. 53% of all of the uh, burden uh, in our tax system goes to indirect tax on consumption. So those who cons consume. 100% of their income, they pay more than those, the rich, who invest, who put money in savings, etc. So the money comes back. We know that in Brazil, 53% uh, of all uh, Bolsa Família benefits given to the poor, they come back to the state under the form of uh, indirect taxes. Okay, so we're just making the, the market work. We're not redistributing. And so this is what it's important to understand. And uh, because the, wo the World Bank and the IMF were against, but now they have a new model, okay? It's not welfare, uh, state system, because this is very expensive, this is very inefficient. We don't want everybody to be similar because otherwise we'll, we will be reducing people's opportunities, of course. You see, if we want a more homogeneous society, how come this is not good? You see, people should be entrepreneurs, they should be dynamic, they have to choose the liberty to choose the, the life they want, etc., etc. And of course, we have also increased uh, precarious jobs worldwide. Why the workfare system has spread so much in the United States and in the UK? Because after Thatcher, it was absolutely necessary to make people accept precarious jobs. People are not used to precarious jobs. They have full-time jobs under the 40s regime, okay? And then comes finance, and com then comes the deregulation of the labor market. And what do you do to oblige people to accept uh, part-time jobs? Uh, it's huge in England, as you know. Everybody wants to go, and all the refugees want to go to England because they have a huge precarious labor market. Everybody can work there. Uh, and uh, why, why was it uh, necessary? Uh, why, w what made people accept? We started multiplying conditionalities on welfare benefits. 
So we reduce the coverage of welfare benef benefits people have, like in the United States. You have to prove that at least you work for uh, 16 hours a week if you want to get a welfare benefit. If, if, you, have, uh, if you don't work at all, you don't get benefits. And uh, 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 imposing conditionalities, controls, they oblige people uh, to go to the labor market again and accept um, part-time jobs, precarious jobs. And this is why social policy has also been linked to the deregulation of the labor market. Instead of guaranteeing, like uh, France in the 70s when I was living here, um, unemployment benefits to those who are unemployed, okay, no more unemployment benefits, they will last for two, three, six months, and then you go to welfare. And if you go to welfare and you don't work at all, Okay, you won't get anything, but if you just work 16 hours, 20 hours, then we will complement your income in the next fiscal year. This is why social policy is always being functional to accumulation regimes. And of course, I under this period of financialization, social policy is losing its own uh, purpose because the, the, the idea of social policy uh, is that we are reducing inequality, we are preventing poverty, and we are also contributing through the homo homogenization of society, making people more equal, uh, to enhance uh, social cohesion uh, and to contribute to improve levels of productivity. But is productivity necessary under financialization? Productivity uh, increases were important under the Fordist regime. Now we have rents uh, uh, that uh, emerge from the financial sector. And they are completely disclosed from productivity. Productivity is not linked uh, to rents that we can get from finance with assets because it's based on property property, huh? assets, actions, etc. cetera, uh, it's property. So it's something radically different. So what is fascinating is that the way social policy is being involved, is being retooled, uh, reshaped, in order to contribute to a new re uh, accumulation regime, but losing its own identity, because uh, uh, this is not the way we should uh, think about social policy. Uh, it was uh, formulated uh, with uh, other uh, objectives. So uh, I'll try to come to your uh, questions, but I was just trying to bring you this um, uh, uh, wide uh, contextualization, because I think that it's important to understand what happened over the last uh, 40 years, since the mid-70s with Reagan, uh, Thatcher and all the chains we had in social policy. Of course, we don't have the dismantlement of all social security systems everywhere because those are institutions and institutions resist. This is why new institutional arrangements are emerging and most of them link to the financial sector. So, uh, how to build welfare states. So this is a long process. It, I think that we have to come back to the idea of institutions. But uh, I think that uh, peers, person and other uh, welfare states scholars have proved that it's very difficult also to uh, dismantle welfare state systems. Huh? So uh, I think that changes are coming from uh, the borders uh, and uh, w what is going on is that we are increasing um, privatization, uh, the uh, private provision, and the difference is that private provision appears to be better than public provision. What contributed to that? First, for fiscal reasons, it was necessary to reduce uh, public jobs, okay? So what happened in Europe? under this uh, austerity plan. I was uh, watching TV yesterday, there was a leftist guy in Portugal, and they are uh, reintroducing 35 hours a week uh, as, um, um, how do you say, semana, uh, 
working days, 35 hours a week, and they will uh, hire uh, 9,000 people in the public <laughs> service. So it's fantastic what is going on in Paraguay. I don't know if it's going to last. But, uh, and why? Uh, because we have uh, dismantled, because we have uh, suppressed, uh, eliminated many public jobs, public service. Uh, also deteriorated. And then you have, you see the impression that going to the private is much better. And then people start going to the private because they want to choose this, this, and that, ta, 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 and it's better. So it's, all, it's a whole strategy that it, it's uh, pulled together uh, to contribute to this. So what is important that some countries in Latin America, not all, have uh, welfare states uh, as institutions that have roots and uh, that are grounded in uh, society. But the point now is that people in Latin America with this idea that, oh, finally we have reached the poor. Because with the um, uh, uh, prior uh, welfare systems that were only contributory, okay, with uh, social insurance, we could not reach the poor. So now we can have strategies that reach the poor. So it's much better because then it was just for the privileges. It's not true. What we need are universal systems. Look at what happens in uh, Denmark, Sweden, always the same. Countries that are very competitive, that are open economies, uh, based on innovation, look at Denmark, and they install programs like uh, welfare states. They have very strong universal welfare states, and they adapted with to this international competition to uh, being more competitive, but they did not really put into question uh, people's rights. So they have universal health, universal education. People don't pay uh, in Denmark uh, to go to college. Uh, look what happened in, in the UK. People now pay 9,000 pounds as tuition. It's a serious problem. It's a mess. They have uh, problems all the time. Uh, young students with huge debts, they start their lives, and they have precarious jobs. Do you know that in the United States, uh, 6 or 7% of all uh, food stamps um, beneficiaries, recipients, uh, they have a college degree, and some are professors, some are teachers at colleges, because teachers at colleges now in the United States, they are paid for hours they, they teach. Okay, so it's precarious job. You teach uh, 12 hours uh, a week or 12 hours a month, you pay 12 hours. You don't have a full job, a full time job. So there are people with PhD um, in the United States that have precarious jobs. And this, this is a whole, uh, um, how to say, systematic dynamic that is taking place. And we have to understand how things are changing. But this is even more important to preserve our welfare systems and to understand why we need to share. This is something that it's necessary to share and to have kind of the, um, the support of other people to maintain. And this is why you have to understand why people are always uh, on strike in France, uh, on the streets. Uh, it's cultural, but it's linked to their uh, institutions. It's not the same in the United States. And so you see, welfare states are country specific. Let's not forget it. So it, it relates to the way people have built their rights and how they share common identities. So it's very complicated. I don't know how we can do. I, I, I think that we should resist and try to implement. And because we have uh, much more um, uh, we have much more flexibilization in the labor market, and instability, uh, and we have this volatility that is due to the increase in uh, financial uh, regimes. I think that it's more important than ever than, uh, to have universal welfare schemes because you move to one position to another. You're not always uh, a regular uh, wage worker. Sometimes you work, uh, there, now there are the slashers uh, workers in France, people who uh, have two or three jobs at a time. Uh, because of course you have uh, small jobs and uh, not regular, not full-time jobs. Like I'm a privileged person because I have a full-time job. I work a lot. I work all every day, a lot of hours, but I have a regular job with a regular pay. This is fantastic. How many of uh, the youth of today are going to have a, a, a 
does. So it's important because people are moving from one job to another to guarantee that they will have a good pension at some point and that basic pensions would be uh, high enough to guarantee uh, well-being to those families, that uh, we will have health care, uh, public health care, because it's important. You, how can you buy a private uh, health care plan if you don't know what kind of, uh, for instance, you just pay a health care plan, you're 23 years old, you're in very good health, you don't have any problems, and all of a sudden you have an accident, you hit by a car, and you have, uh, I don't know, a problem for the rest of your life. Ah, but your health care plan did not cover it. Huh? So this is the problem. So we need regulation. This is what Obama did in the United States. They tried to regulate private uh, health care uh, provision. But this is not enough, because in any point, we, can, we don't know. It's impossible to know what's going to happen to us, what kind of new diseases will come, will emerge. Okay, So it's important to have public provision. And the more uh, flexible is the labor market, the more universal should be provision. And so this is why we need universal welfare systems. Uh, so talking about. Um, uh, Tombini uh, saying that uh, interest rates uh, are sustainable in Brazil. Tombini, who is the head of the central bank in Brazil, he knows that uh, the current inflation rate in Brazil, which is around 10%, which is high, but there should not be a problem. Uh, the inflation rate comes from the increase in um, administrative uh, services, prices of administrative service, which is electricity, etc., that have been lowered for a long time and that have increased. Uh, electricity went up for more than 60% in one year. Okay? So what is making inflation uh, grow again is first uh, increases in um, administrative uh, prices, those run by the government, and also the fact that we have devalued the currency in order to export because we have uh, lived on uh, overvalued currency, as I showed you. And now it's important to try to export again, of course, as a way of uh, going out from uh, this um, crisis. Because it's not by expanding domestic market that things will change. So if the problem is because the, also the inflation is going up, because the dollar was valorized by 65% in one year. So why increase interest rates? Because it's not a problem of overconsumption. It's not on the side of the demand a problem of um, um, high inflation rates in Brazil. So this is the question. No, he's putting a lot of money in the, the hands of uh, those who are the, the creditors of the Brazilian debt. The Brazilian debt this year will uh, give 9% of our GDP to those who have uh, public bonds, Brazilian public bonds. It's more than we spend with um, uh, pensions, public pensions in Brazil. We spend 8% of our GDP with public pensions. Think People think we should privatize public pensions. The scandal, oh, look at this. We're spending 8%, but we're paying 9% to... 30,000 or 40,000 people who are the, the creditors who owe the Brazilian uh, bonds. This is not a scandal. So this is the problem. We should look at things uh, in a more uh, integrated and broad way. So Tombini knows that he's doing the wrong thing. But uh, of course, when Lula asked the, the, the president of the largest Brazilian private bank, Bradesco, the second one, and invites him to be minister of economy in Brazil, it's, there is a problem, of course. And then social developmentalist thinks that the Brazilian developmentalist state has a lot of autonomy in order to implement macroeconomic policies. OK, guys. OK, so I'll stop here. OK, turn us off first. Woman first. Uh, 
um, can I ask? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, just to, uh, my name is Teresa. Just to pick up with your last comment, do you think that uh, this idea of uh, the central bank that they should still increase interest rates even though it's already very high and there's not really a demand problem? Um, do you think that's uh, kind of an ideology that uh, you always have to increase interest rates to fight inflation or do you think it's also a political pressure from uh, the financial sector to increase it even more? Um, thank you for your very interesting presentation. Um, you seem to suggest that the expansion of consumption demand was behind the growth of a household goods sector in Brazil. Um, but beyond this, I was wondering whether you would say that this consumption demand augmenting social developmentalist approach has been directly responsible in any way for the current Brazilian crisis, particularly the persistent current account deficit. Um, and maybe another way of phrasing my question is to ask uh, is a social developmentalist approach actually consistent with an agenda to push development and structural change beyond reliance on production of low-processed agriculture and resource extraction? Um, for me, it's not necessary, necessarily necessary to use the concept of financialization to understand the failure to realize expanded real investment in Brazil, even though it may play a part. I think maybe in theory it's sufficient to focus on what the consumption demand augmenting approach has meant for the current account deficit and how financing that deficit through um, high real interest rates has depressed real investment. So if, if this analysis is true, maybe we need to shift away from, from focusing on our critique specifically on like a microcredit dimension and rather focus more generally on the limitations of the consumption demand led growth and social de developmentalist strategy um, which for me tries to recreate like Fordism in one country in a substantially different global um, political and economic environment um, to that in which it emerged. Um, my question directly um, yeah, picks up this idea, uh, the question of consumption demand. So when there is this problem that consumption demand usually um, leads to more imports because as you said in the beginning of your presentation there are many manufactured goods that are not available in Brazil so they have to be imported. How would you address more the, the su supply side of uh, consumption to, um, yeah, to, to deal with this problem of the deteriorating current account? Um, I have one question if uh, anyone else doesn't have. So actually my question also picks up from the Carson's question. Uh, in we know that in the last years in many developing countries, uh, exchange rate is used as an anchor to control the inflation. And at some point in your presentation, you mentioned that the exchange rate in Brazil was overvalued for some period. So I suppose that this might have put dominant pressure on the inflation rate. But at the same time, if the increase in consumption, if some part of it went to imported consumption goods, this might have put upward pressure on the inflation rate. So I was wondering uh, what happened to the nominal gains from increasing uh, minimum wages, for instance. Was the inflation um, taking back the nominal gains in the uh, minimum wages and what was the inflation trend during this period? Okay, let me start here. Uh, look, inflation rates in Brazil in average were uh, below 5%. Okay, and uh, the minimum wage went up by 70% uh, during this period. So, in real terms. So it's not really uh, uh, the increase in wages that increased. It pushed demand, okay, it was important. The big problem is that the government did not have any uh, strategy in order to spend investment in Brazil. And this is always a problem because Brazil has not, the, the Workers' Party government did not abandon the macroeconomic tripod, which is overvalued currency, 
high interest rates and control yeah the primary surplus because uh, we could have spent much more but we are forming our primary surplus so a lot of savings we were putting aside instead of for instance trying to develop new industrial policies which was expected in Brazil even the BNDES we have a specific bank for this was unable to really push for investments. They had a very specific strategy that was uh, focusing on uh, let's strengthen uh, those who are global, global players because uh, as such Brazil will kind of benefit uh, from a very fast uh, penetration in global markets and this is why we have become uh, an exporter of uh, uh, commodities again <laughs> instead of being exported of uh, uh, industrial goods so this is a big problem and I think that the problem in Brazil was that there was this short-term vision because uh, the the strategy of uh, the workers party was to stay in power for at least one generation 25 years and this short-term strategy uh, because when you think about long-term uh, investment you need some time to mature investments, okay? You have to have a strategy, etc. So first, uh, uh, industrialization was not encouraged. It was discouraged because, uh, of course, uh, we still had very high interest rates. Okay, so why uh, investing if you can place your money at the federal bank and get uh, eight, nine percent? You see, uh, Dilma. Uh, achieved a, a big success because she, she put uh, the CELIC, the base interest rates of the, road, the central bank, at 7.5 with an inflation rate of 4. So this was 3% uh, real interest rates. Fantastic. But it didn't last long. There was a reaction. And so it's again very high, okay, and it will continue to go up because this is a financialized, financialized economy. Brazil is a financialized economy because of course we have this uh, microeconomic tripod and so this is something that hasn't been put, this is why we call this, this a hybrid politics. This is what uh, the, workers park, uh, um, the workers party did. He maintained the same policy that was implemented under Fernando Henrique Cardoso. Okay? And why it was important to keep uh, uh, the currency overvalued because of course you, you put in a very short term you could import a lot of stuff and this destroyed the Brazilian industry as well okay so we had this commodity boom so who are the exporters not industries but uh, uh, the agribusiness they were happy everybody was happy and then this is what Brazil 49 percent of all our, our, our exports now, now are commodities it used to be 19% 10 years ago. <laughs> you see, we export commodities, uh, and this is it. And this is why you have these ruralist guys that run the, the Congress, too, uh, and that uh, uh, run Brazil, by the way. So it's much more complicated because it's not, you see, we have, um, how do we say enfraquecer? Thank you. We have weakened uh, in the industrial sector in Brazil. And I think that this was a short-term strategy because it was, and what happened when we imported with a dollar very low? Uh, prices were going down all the time. So you see services had prices going up, so we had this inflation for uh, uh, services, but uh, home appliances were going down. Impressive. So everybody could buy, you see, uh, washing machines, etc. Et it was very cheap. So imports did not contribute it maintained inflation very low uh, and uh, of course we had this uh, um, short uh, short sightedness but also short short term strategy that had to be implemented so uh, the question is why when this uh, commodity boom stopped Brazil did not move because we had this commodity okay so we had dollars coming in we now have uh, our international reserves is 375 billion. Look at Argentina, it's 30 billion or less now. I think it's 25. So nothing compared to Argentina. Argentina is in big trouble uh, if there is an external shock, not, shock, not Brazil. 
So what happened? Why Brazil did not move towards more investments? So this is the understanding that most economies, developmentalist economies have, said that Brazil <coughs> missed the opportunity to move towards a new uh, strategy that would uh, focus on investments. But this doesn't happen all of a sudden, because if you have an economy which is run by finance, things doesn't happen like this all of a sudden. And so uh, what happened, we still have again, uh, we, we have a currency that has been devalued, so we are again exporting much better, everybody's happy, but uh, interest rates are very high. And so how are we going to have investments, innovation, with so high interest rates? How long is it going to take? So Brazil is a big mess. Uh, and I think that uh, this relates to this macroeconomic uh, tripod that uh, runs the Brazilian economy since the mid-90s. And it hasn't really changed. So. Uh, let me see. So the four, the four this model is the same, same idea. We need to invest, okay, in innovation. And uh, Brazil was unable to invest. Investments uh, remained very low uh, as uh, a component of aggregate demand. And, uh, and the, the funny thing is that when you read social development, at least they say everybody was benefiting from this because everybody was really you see, during this period of uh, economic growth, nobody worsened its situation in Brazil, not even the rich. They lost, you see, very slightly their position within uh, national income, but not much, because for the 1% uh, wealthier and the 0.1% wealthier, their uh, part, uh, their share in, in Brazilian income increased. Okay, so everybody, the, the idea is that everybody's benefiting from this uh, social developmentalist model, which was wrong because it could not be sustained for a while. And Ricardo Bielschowski, who was the, the guy who thought about this model, who formulated this model, he was sure that it was the Workers' Party would uh, receive a lot of, um, would be backed in the strategy because everybody was benefiting at the same time. So it, nobody would be against this model of development. Huh? And it was a shorter model in, in, in order to capture, the, let's say, um, the support huh, of voters in Brazil to maintain, again, this price and see how things would change. And then there was this uh, 2008 uh, crisis that changed things. In 2010, Brazil reacted uh, pretty well, and then we started losing ground, uh, losing ground, and then things deteriorated very fast. And the point now is that the Workers' Party also lost political support. There is no more political support to run with a coalition that would allow Brazil to choose one or another path of uh, economic recovery, because there is no more political support for anything. And uh, without political support, really, you cannot implement anything. And this is the big problem we have today in Brazil. Uh, there is no majority for this. So I think that uh, the Fordist model, uh, contrary to what happened in Brazil, is not only based on consumption, but on innovation. Huh? Because you, you associate uh, um, a Keynesian approach on demand with a Kalikian approach in terms of innovation. And there was no innovation in the social developmentalist model. They thought that at some point it would happen, but it didn't happen. And uh, what, where was innovation in Brazil? In the commodity sector, oil and uh, agriculture. And it, it's only there where innovation. So if you look to productivity shares in, um, in agriculture and in the oil sector, mineral sector, you're going to see that productivity went up. This is a very small share of the Brazilian economy. So for the rest, you see, for 25 years, the average increase per year in uh, productivity is 1%, which is nothing. Okay, so there is a problem. It's a society uh, that was unable to innovate. And, and the, 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 but because the idea was, we have an obstacle to expand domestic markets in Latin America due to the 
informality in the labor market to this high social and productive heterogeneity. So let's put everybody into the labor market. Let's monetarize everybody. Let's create formal jobs. But 84% of formal jobs, less than two minimum wages. So you're not really uh, making the society move up. Right? You're not moving up in the value-added uh, curve. Okay, you're not doing this. But this was not a problem because there was consumption. And the idea is that at some point, it's going to have a start and things will change. And then we had the crisis and things haven't changed and now there is no political support. So I think that we have to understand that the Fordist regime worked in a completely different way from what is going on in Brazil. Huh? And, uh, and why the supply side did not uh, um, oppose this model? Huh? Why industrials? Because everybody was making money with the financial sector. We have to understand this is what I told you. You see, you have increases in profits that do not translate in increases in investments. Because this is a financialized uh, economy. It doesn't look like, but it is. And your question on the ideology uh, of the world, uh, the central bank. Well, uh, it's the same question. I think that we have this micro, uh, microeconomic uh, tripod. You see, macroeconomics in Brazil uh, hasn't changed. And uh, I think that there is ideology because there is a huge pressure from uh, the wealth sectors in Brazil that uh, it's necessary to combat inflation. It's true that we have this idea that inflation can reach 2,000% per year, which is completely dramatic. But uh, I really think that uh, the, the, world, the, the central bank, um, the idea that we need to form this uh, primary surplus in Brazil uh, is something that uh, now we have a deficit, uh, second year with a deficit. This year, I think it will be 3 or 4%. So it's huge. So the idea is that we have to, uh, again, uh, form a primary surplus in order to uh, move out from this crisis. And uh, the central bank, I think, has no autonomy. So it's not that it's only ideology. It's that, uh, you see, there, there, there are pressures from all sides that it's really necessary to maintain uh, this model formation of primary surplus, and then you see uh, paralyze the economy, and all of a sudden prices will go down, and then if prices go down, then we can restart slowly, etc. So it's really a development model that is in, has been in place since Fernando Henrique Cardoso, and that has been uh, backed by the Workers' Party when Lula arrived. And this is why Lula arrived, because he accepted to play the game. Uh, more questions? Um, thank you for the presentation. I have a question about the capital outflows from Brazil. Like uh, how you said in your presentation, in Brazil uh, there is very low direct taxes, especially for the rich. So if those who are in financial circles getting money from the uh, high interest rates credits, so they can actually invest this money out of Brazil. So won't um, the, the uh, um, payment in cash to the poor actually keep money in Brazil because they will buy it and will they spend money on the products uh, rather than taking credits? Because when they take credits, they um, somehow help to the rich to take money out of Brazil, so it will slow down the economy. So look at this. Why rich Brazilians or uh, you see Brazil has a lot of foreign direct investments. It's going up again very fast. Do you know any place in the world where you can buy uh, treasury bonds paying 14%, 25%? Anywhere in the world? Why people would take their money out of Brazil? Sorry, guys. Money is coming in. You see, people buy assets in Brazil. And Brazil is now, again, very cheap. So money is not going out. <laughs> yeah, the money is coming in because Brazilians' assets are very, very cheap. You have a lot of Brazilian enterprise that are broke. And the guys come, and there is a lot of merges now taking place because with the devalue uh, of the currency, the currency has been devalued. So Brazilian assets are very cheap. There is a process. You see, uh, um, um, 
um, airplane companies and things like this. There are merges everywhere. So I don't agree with you because there is no reason for the money to, to leave Brazil. There is a lot of reason for money to get into Brazil. And besides, uh, they have a very, um, how would I say, uh, positive uh, tax rate tax system f because if you invest in Brazil and if you come from abroad you don't pay uh, ta taxes in the financial sector very low in our tax system it's around three or four percent it's nothing so you don't pay much taxes if you uh, gamble in the financial sector okay and there are special uh, rates exemptions for those who uh, bring uh, money within Brazil. So w you have a lot, we have a lot now, a lot of um, international pension funds that are coming back to Brazil. Since as they went to Argentina in the past, uh, we know the story. So the, the profitability of uh, the Brazilian uh, financial system is pretty high. <laughs> Um, hi, um, in some point of your presentation, I think you mentioned that uh, something like 35% of the fund from pension system go to the financial sector or something like that. But at the same time, you mentioned that uh, Brazil is still is a pay-as-you-go system. So I don't understand. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Okay, so maybe I... I said it wrongly. What I said is that if you look for uh, at uh, those who took loans in the fi in the credit market, the consigned credit, 35 percent are uh, retired from the public pay-as-you-go system. This is what I said. Okay. The other uh, the other 60 percent are uh, public servants. So this consigned credit, which is a huge part of consumer credit now in Brazil, is more than 50%, goes to two categories of pensioners and works who have the state behind as a guarantor. Okay, so the state is guaranteeing this income. And this is why many people think, for instance, that in Brazil, uh, the idea that we should um, separate uh, the minimum wage for, from the basic pensions. 67% of all basic pensions in Brazil are paid one minimum wage. And the minimum wage went up, so everybody benefited. Uh, retired benefited a lot, which is pretty good because you don't have a good health system, so they can pay for their medicine, etc. Uh, so everybody benefited. But uh, you see now people say, we need to reform uh, the pension system. It is a scandal. We have to break this uh, link between minimum wages and uh, pensions. But do you think that the bank system will allow it? Because if they allow it, what is the collateral? <laughs> because people are going to the, to the financial market to get loans because they have a basic pension which uh, values one minimum wage. So if you separate, and first, people have contributed for many years because they were supposed to receive a minimum So are you going to break contracts? And all of a sudden, you see the conservative guy says, OK, let's change it. Let's split. We don't need them. We, it's uh, too, m too much expensive to pay basic pensions a minimum wage. But people have paid for 30 years, 40 years to get a minimum wage. And now you just break the contract. You see, but this is the idea. So this is what I said, that those who take uh, consigned credit, 35% uh, of consigned credit are given to retires. It's OK. So thank you. And I just, uh, I do hope that you're going to be interested in studying Brazil and Latin America. There is a book of mine and Barbara Fritz who has just came out. It's about, it's called A Moment of Equality in Latin America. And we put a quotation uh, mark. And I think we were right, thank God you did it. And he was just out uh, by Ashgate. And there are many, many papers on 
uh, volatility in, in Latin America, what help with social protection systems, what are the problems uh, with regard to uh, innovation systems. It's, it's very interesting and uh, we have Ruben Lovol, we have also Gerhard Terborn, who is a brilliant sociologist who was very much um, optimistic about Latin America. I'm going to meet him in two weeks from now, so let's see how, how he sees things now. But anyway, Latin America is very fascinating. It's a wonderful country with wonderful people, Brazil too. So I hope that uh, you will be interested in uh, looking uh, in depth what is going on there. Thank you so much.